Right on, and welcome back to Music Study Part 2, and for Part 2, my special guest is Brian, who is one man standing. Welcome to the show, Brian. Hey, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. I'm totally pumped to be on. Oh, anytime, man. I appreciate you doing this last minute for me as well. So, uh, we've been uh, a big fan because, uh, obviously, the co-hosts have been uh, going back and forth because of, of time and uh, people's availability, but that's fine. But uh, let's get talking about your brand new EP called Valley of the Lost. Now, first off, Brian, Valley of the Lost, it just sounds so cool. Where'd you come up with that name? Uh, Valley of Lost Connections actually came up from uh, when I was doing one of the songs. Uh, one of the samples actually reminded me of uh, almost like a dial tone or uh, like, a, like a weird like lost connection, almost like a weird fax machine or something. And um, I thought, wow, it almost sounds like kind of a lost connection. And uh, I ended up uh, taking that title and uh, making that the title of the EP, and um, I believe uh, the song uh, ended up being Passion to Ashes, and um, that's kind of where that title came from. Uh, once I heard that sample while I was making that song, it kind of just got my brain kicking, and um, I kind of came up with that theme, so I kind of like that, so that's how that ended up coming up. Right on. Well, you know what? It's, it's cool the thing of some of how those names come up, because a lot of them are somewhat random, yeah. and... You know, I know the only thing I mean by that is like, you know what, the band or artist thinks about it, said, so, you know what, me will do it this way, and then it's like, no, that doesn't sound different. Then all of a sudden, like, something just kind of pops in, like, the, the light bulb goes off. It's like, you know what, that sounds perfect. Let's go with that. Yeah, yeah. I've run into that uh, numerous times. Um, uh, with me, it's just I kind of sit down and um, I don't really have, get a melody in my mind. I'll just kind of start playing around and. Once I start monkeying around, I kind of get a groove and I lay a couple of things down. And then I actually kind of, uh, I don't know, I almost feel like I, I don't do it on purpose, but all the music uh, has kind of just come to me and I just kind of lay it down. And my brain just kind of vibrates the right way when I hear certain things and I like the, the way certain things sound. So that's kind of the way that I always come up with stuff. Right on. Now, now Brian, what exactly are you working with? Meaning, like, uh, how do you come up with the songs? Like, do you have like a, multiple recording sessions or like how do you work that? Uh, most of the time I'll usually, um, I guess kind of being, you know, the type of personality that I am, I, I just get kind of locked into one project at a time. And uh, most of the time I'll actually just sit down and probably open up a program and uh, most likely, you know, just start playing an instrument, um, maybe, you know, a little bit of a keyboard or synth and, uh, you know, once I kind of get a feel of how that mood feels at that point in time, I kind of write around that. And um, I'm lucky that I can kind of walk away from it and, you know, take a break for a day or so and come back to it and just kind of build on it. Um, and luckily, it's it's worked out. It's worked out nicely. So most of the time, I usually uh, just get uh, inspiration from just sitting down and, you know, just actually doing it. I always thought the hardest thing about actually making music was actually sitting down and taking the time to do it and make it make it work. And right, you know, once once you get started, everything just kind of flows for me. I'm really blessed that that the ideas really come out like that. You know, I'm, I'm want to ask you that specifically because one of the songs we're going we're gonna to be playing later tonight is by an artist called Peter Klein, and Peter Klein's been in like the music business for a long time, like with the electro, uh, electronic stuff and with him the way he does it is he has like one shot and one shot only to kind of make the song the way he wants it otherwise he's got to scrap and start all over again 
So <laughs> I'm just kind of curious as to how other people work with their music just because of the way he does it. You know, it's kind of always been a kind of a, it's kind of staple in my head the first, since the first time I interviewed him. And uh, it's always curious to me as how that works because you guys are working with a, a whole different level of, of um, production. Yeah, it's it's actually um, it's actually just me. I'm I actually do the whole thing um, from start to finish. I don't really have anybody else involved at all. Um, and usually, I don't I don't create demos or rough drafts or anything like that. There really is only a few songs that I had in the past that never really made the cut. And it was primarily when I didn't have enough studio equipment and I couldn't get the sound just right. Um, they're still kind of in the archives, but I've never really opened them back up. Some of the stuff I've taken and, and made into new songs, but um, I'm not really one for demos or this song is, you know, only half good. I usually actually take the song and, you know, I follow through with it 100%. It, I don't always do it in one shot where I sit down for two hours and by the end of a three-hour session I have a whole song. But right. uh, I never really make multiple versions of songs. That's kind of rare for me. Um, I just, I don't know, most of the, that's why I say I'm kind of blessed that way. I, all the songs that I've pretty much wrote, I pretty much sat down, wrote them from start to finish, and, you know, they've really worked out like that. I've been, you know, thankful for that. Right on. Now, is it safe to say that uh, most of the songs uh, you have a preconceived idea for ahead of time, or does it just kind of happen on the go? The nice thing is, is that it just kind of happens on the go. Um, I usually... You know, if I hear a lot of stuff or I get a melody in my head, um, my iPhone is full of stuff on the sound recorder right. that are just, you know, just me making weird sounds or drum loops or, you know, even if I just pick up my acoustic guitar and I'll just play something real weird and, you know, it sounds really good, I'll record it. Um, and then sometimes I'll recreate it in the studio, which, you know, that, that I've done before in the past. But that's kind of, you know, where that's, if anything, that's my drawing board or anything like that i have lots of you know stuff that's just on my phone that i come back to and i'll be like oh yeah that's i, I want to use that in this song or you know sometimes i'll just come back to that one drum sound that i have in my head like that that loop that i made and right. i'm like yeah i want to build a song off of that so i kind of do that too well the, the memo function is a beautiful thing on the iphone that's for sure yeah that's worth its weight in platinum <laughs> <laughs> right on well, you know, it's uh, with electronic music, it, it's always a, a, a different interest to me just because uh, it's created uh, somewhat differently from the, we'll call it the conventional, like rock and roll slash pop music. And where you're not necessarily doing a verse, chorus, verse, you know, you're doing a lot of intricate different things, a bunch of different layers. Now, with that being said, um, how do you uh, kind of come up with some of the layering? Does, does it, how does it make sense to you? Like, I mean, I know I'm, I'm trying to the best way to phrase this but uh when you're recording a song and you're starting to record it uh with the layering how do you figure like this will work with what or how how it how's that kind of kind of come together um i'm actually i come from a background of you know working in bands and you know stuff like that so i'm pretty much i i still have the thought process of you know, verse, chorus, bridge, stuff like that and a lot of my songs are kind of they, they do have that in there um, so most of the time my brain actually just kind of goes to that. So there's a lot of songs that still do that. Some of them don't, but, um, I, I have that, you know, that training in my head that I got to come back to that. So most of the time when I sit down and I write something, um, I'll create two or three different parts and then I actually kind of arrange them the way that I want. And I'll say, all right, this is more powerful for a chorus area, or this is, you know, more powerful. Like some of the songs will have like really hard synth lines in them and I'll be like, you know, that's, that's the driving force. That's got to be, you know, either like the rhythm or that's got to be the lead or stuff like that. So I, that, that's how I kind of get that stuff together. Well, it, that being said, um, compared to your previous EP to this one, what have you found has a kind, of, kind of changed a little bit? How, how have you evolved from the last one to this one? Um, I guess it's just a matter of, you know, where, where your head's at at the time. Um, that EP... Uh, actually started to take shape and was written in about 2013 and it took me about two years to, to finish my very first one sketchbook of the scars and um, I think that was probably just because of where I was at you know technology wise studio right. wise what I could do and also where what ideas and where my head was at at the time 
um, with my once I launched that in 2015 in October, um, I kind of you know went back to the drawing board and I said, all right, well you know this was good, but what can I do a little bit better? And when I finally sat down to to actually do Valley of Lost Connections. Um, I was at a totally different point as far as, you know, technology goes and stuff like that. So things became a little bit easier. I, I was a little bit more tuned into how to make electronic music more than my typical background, which was, you know, being in a studio environment with, you know, analog, you know, instruments and, right. you know, miking and stuff like that. So it came together a little bit different and I got to experiment with a lot more things uh, like this this ep i have a you know i got to do a there i got to use my theremin a lot and you know i did i did some wild stuff um i got to incorporate a lot of different instruments that i didn't get to do on the first one so i was really psyched about that and i think it came out pretty good i was i was happy with it um you know even even some of the we talk about you know we were talking about before with old demos and stuff like that right you know one song off of valley of lost connections actually i wrote when i was uh when i was 15. Um, nice. So you're going back about you know 20 years, yeah. and I wrote I wrote it in high school, and that piano lead was actually something that I played in uh, my uh, my music class, and my teacher thought it was creepy but good. <laughs> <laughs> right on, nice. You know, just before we get to our first song here, just to kind of step off that a little bit, uh, I'll, I was born and raised in Montreal, uh, in Canada, but I lived in Michigan for about uh, uh, six years. And my point I was getting to is that uh, Chad Smith, who's the drummer for the Red Chili Peppers, for a, for a while, for a number of years, he came back to uh, the high school I went to, the freshman class, and he'd sign autographs and he'd do a quick class and a quick lesson with him. And uh, I got actually got a chance to meet him. And Chad Smith is by far one of the nicest people you'll ever meet in the world. Oh, that's great. And, and uh, that's. I really like it when you can when you actually meet a lot of people. I've been I've been really lucky that just about every show that I've ever gotten to, um, I usually end up meeting the artist somehow or some way or another, and um, it's been it's been really cool and inspirational. Some of them have been really good. Some of them have tried to beat me up, but <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's it's been a it's been a good trip. So I absolutely know what you what you agree with there or what you're getting at there. I mean, right I played up. a show when I was in high school with. Uh, Keith Caputo from Life of Agony, and um, no he, way, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, man. Keith was uh, it was right after Life of Agony broke up, and uh, he started his own band called Absolute Bloom. And um, I actually got to open for them. I put the I put the whole show together myself, and he was the nicest guy ever, and super cool, man. He was he was so it was it was really inspirational. Every time I meet somebody, just like you said, that's you know made it really far and. You know, you get to talk to them and stuff like that, and you know, just kind of see how real they are. I think you like them about a hundred times more, and then you'll, you know, do anything for them. Man, that is so cool that you mentioned Life of Agony because I remember them, man. Because I remember going to see Life of Agony when River Runs Red came out. Oh my god! Oh that's... man, and that is such a great album. I, I honestly, is probably I fucking love that album. It's my favorite male albums ever. Like. I think I had to buy two of those discs because I wore the first one out, and I think I wore out the second one ugly too. I... <laughs> uh, what a great album, man! And just just completely unexpected, just because the vocals were from the, from the the very like like really high peak to like kind of low. Like, like he did it so well, like man, I'm uh, that's amazing. That's so awesome that you mentioned that. Like, wow, Brian, man, you made my night, buddy. That was amazing. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, he was a super cool guy, and it's it's amazing because he's a really tiny guy too. To see, oh yeah. To see him and just have him belt out those notes, and you know, it's it's amazing to see. Right. I was, it, you know, maybe that was definitely one of the high points when I was, you know, in high school and I got to play a show with him. So I was maybe just, maybe made my senior year. Yeah, maybe five foot five years in. I still have the shirt with a life lightning crest on the on the left side at the top, and it says life lightning in the back. Man, I, I got that at the show. Oh man, that was like ninety five. I bet you could probably get if you if you ever wanted to part with it, you could probably get three hundred bucks for that shirt on eBay or something. No chance in hell that I'm getting rid of that one. That's one of my favorite t-shirts ever. <laughs> yeah, I'm in the same boat. I have a lot of I have a lot of good old shirts too that I just can't get rid of because I just have such sentimental attachments to them. And oh, for my life of agony. I think there was a there was a hoodie that I actually bought uh, from those guys. And it took, uh, it took about three or four months to actually get, cause they stopped making them. Right. And then when I pestered him enough, they finally made another one and sent it out. So, and I actually got a, he actually gave me a shirt from, uh, when I played at that show with them, uh, of absolute bloom, which I think there's probably only maybe about 50,